All right. Let's um, pray and we will start. Father, we thank you for uh, another day and thank you for the opportunity, God, to come together and uh, spend time in, in the Word of God and in your presence. We invite, Lord, the ministry of the Holy Spirit to write truth into our hearts, to open our eyes, to understand, our ears to hear, our hearts to receive, so that, God, your Word be established in our lives and and help uh, and transform us to conform us to your word. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, so let's go now to um, the uh, section five identified with Christ. Section five identified with Christ, lesson number 43. On page 59, uh, we started this um, last week, and uh, we're going to continue. Let me just go ahead and share. Share this, okay. So we made mention last week that there's this powerful truth in the Bible of identification of being identified with Jesus that what happened to Jesus 2000 years ago when he died on the cross in his death in his burial in his resurrection in his ascension and in his exaltation at the father's right hand God has identified you and me with that so we were not born that happened 2,000 years ago, they were not there. But God said, in the mind of God, he's saying, I'm counting it as though you were there. It's a fact. And therefore, in time, when believers come, and you and I are believers today, what happened 2,000 years ago becomes a reality for you and me today, even though we were not there. Because God said, in, in, this is what God planned. In the mind of God, you and I were in Christ. And we went through the whole thing ourselves. Right? So when Christ was crucified, you and I were crucified. Right? When Christ was crucified, you and I were crucified. And so uh, Romans chapter 6 brings this out very powerfully. So we started looking at Romans chapter 6. And... Um, the verse we were focusing on is Romans 6, verse 6. Who memorized that? Romans 6, verse 6. Who hasn't uh, uh, shared so, I mean, spoken so far? One of you. Uh, okay, take the mic, please, and give me Romans. Give us Romans chapter 6, verse 6. Yeah, somebody from the back. Uh, Romans 6, verse 6. All right, let's pass the mic. I please say it from memory. It's a very powerful verse, so it's really good to memorize that. Yes, please. Uh, Romans 6, verse 1. Uh, verse 6. Verse 6. Uh, uh, knowing this, depends on which version of the Bible you use. Go ahead. I remember when I thought one Romans 6 1. Okay, you say verse 1, somebody else will say verse 6. What, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. Uh, uh, we forgot. Okay, that's fine. Good, good, you tried. Verse 6, verse 6. Give, some, give the mic to somebody. Verse 6. Who wants to say verse 6? You can sit down and say it. Yeah. Knowing this, that our old body was crucified with him, uh, that uh, the sin, uh, uh, that uh, the body of sin uh, might be uh, done uh, away. Uh, this uh, uh, with uh, that uh, we should be no longer slaves of sin. Good. Very good. Good job. 
Okay, thank you. It's a very powerful verse. Romans 6 verse 6. So what Paul is saying is he's saying we must know this. Knowing this. Right? So the sad part is many believers don't know it. Right? So if you don't know it, then you cannot experience the truth. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So before the truth can set you free, you must know the truth. Right? So Paul says, knowing this, so you need to know. That's why we are studying. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. Your old man was crucified. Crucified means put to death. Done away with. Gone. Old man. What's the talking about old man? It's the old sinful nature that we received through Adam. Right? So people use different language. Sometimes they say sinful nature. Sometimes they say Adamic nature, old nature. Whatever language you want is okay. But it is that nature that, that, is, that was in us that made us sinful. That made us, that gave us the propensity to sin, want to do sin. That old man, Bible says, has been crucified. Crucified means put to death. So when Christ died, the old man died. The, the old sinful nature died. So that, Romans 6 6 it says, the power of sin, the body of sin over our lives is gone. And we should no longer be slaves of sin. So this is truth. The truth is, as a believer, you don't have to be a slave of sin. So one example that, that, uh, that I, I like to use to illustrate this, if you think of a man who was a drunkard, think uh, he was from morning, after night, just drinking, drinking, drinking. Suppose he dies. His body is lying there. Around his casket, you can put all his favorite drinks. But he won't even move his little finger. Why? Because he is dead. He's dead. So that is our old man. Old man is dead. That's why in Romans 6 verse 7, if you, Romans 6, if you look at it in page 60, Romans 6 verse 7, He who has died has been freed from sin. If you're dead, you're free from sin. And he's saying, in Christ, this old man died. So we are free from sin. So you have to stand up and say, I am free from sin. You have to know the truth. You have to embrace the truth. You know, and if you look at verse 14, Romans 6 verse 14, bottom of page 60, this is another powerful verse to memorize. So try and memorize this. Romans 6 verse 14. Very powerful verse. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Sin will not have dominion over you. So let's all say that together. Sin will not have dominion over me. It's in the Bible. Sin will not have more power, will not have any power over you, will not have dominion over you. Romans 6.14 because you're not under law, but under grace. What is the difference? Under the law, God gave the commandments. Example, 10 commandments he gave. Under the law, he gave commandments. So, thou shall not do this, thou shall not steal, thou shall not commit adultery, thou shall not covet. All the commandments he gave. But problem was, the sinful nature was in, still in them. So, Although they knew the commandments, they couldn't follow it. They didn't have the power to obey the commandments. God gave the law. He told them what is right and what is wrong. They know what is right and wrong. Maybe they even wanted to do what is right. But because of that sin nature, they just ended up doing what was wrong. But you come under grace, things are different. Under grace, God does the work. 
he finishes the work. He says, I will destroy the old man. Now you can do what is right. So you're not under law, you are under grace. So under grace, we have no excuse. Under grace, we don't have to sin. For sin, Romans 6.14, sin will not have dominion over you. Because you're not under law, you're under grace. Under grace, God has finished the work. And he says, come on, you enjoy it. He did the work on the cross. Jesus broke the power of sin. Now, so now you live from it. Live free from sin. Right? So, for you and me, whatever sin. So, in this world, we will face temptation. I'm not saying we won't face temptation. We are in this world. So, sin will come knocking. Temptation will come. Okay. But that is when you have, you and I have to say, sin will not have dominion over me. Sin is around us, all around us. Everybody else may be sinning, doing those things. It's all around us. I'm not saying it's not. It's there. But as a believer, when Christ died, you died. God set you free from sin. So now you can say, sin will not have dominion over question oh. so as you said that sin is all around us roaming around us knocking doors day to day in our daily life yes and then you said that uh, we should speak sin shall not Shall, uh, sin shall no longer have dominion over us. Okay. Yes. So it, it is a practice of saying this, like ah, oh, it's a it's important. Right. Why why is it important? Why must we say it? Because remember, the Bible tells us, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So the word of God is our so. How do you use it? You must. I think somebody's mic is on. All right. Yes. We, we need to. Somebody needs to mute. Okay. Uh, All right. Okay. All right. So, what are we saying? Yeah. Thought. Yeah. So, the, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. How do we use the sword? We have to speak it. Example, you see Jesus in Revelation 19. It says, a double-edged sword went out of his mouth. What is it? It's the word he's speaking. It's the sword, right? So, and even Jesus on the earth, when he was tempted, he said, it is written. He spoke the scriptures. right? So that's why for us it is very important to speak the scriptures. Say it. So when temptation comes, uh, you feel tempted. And just generally, anytime, you say, sin will not have dominion over me. No sin will have any dominion over me. Say it. That gives us the ability to walk in the word of God. Uh, so, so, Pastor, why still we sin? Yeah. So the, the reason we still sin, two reasons, right? Our mind has to be renewed. Because a believer can still have a carnal mind, a fleshly mind. See, we are in Romans chapter 6. So Paul describes this for us. Then in chapter 8, which we will be coming to in the next lesson, he tells us, he's writing to believers. He says, if you are carnally minded, you will die. But if you are spiritually minded, you will have life and peace. So to believers. So God has done this work, but there are still two things we have to do. One, and we see it in Romans 8. One, we have to renew our minds change how we think we can't think 
according to the flesh. We have to think according to the spirit. If a believer is continuing to think according to the flesh, ah, how can I do this? How can I do that? He's fleshly minded. Then Paul says, Romans 8, you still die. So that is one thing. Okay? Our mind. And second, our body. That's Romans 8, 13. He says, if you by the spirit crucify the deeds of your body, you will live. So that is the second thing. We have to crucify, put to death the deeds, the sinful desires of the body. So two things we still have to do. We'll see the next lesson. It is intentionally we have to do, right? Mm. It's the way we live. Way we live. Right? Yeah, how we live, no? Uh, it is just normal. So we live with the spiritual mind and crucify the flesh. So we have to work on ourselves intentionally, right? Yes. With God's help. With God's help. And uh, what is that but under grace? It's like the grace of second chance we always get. Like no, we ask for forgiveness about, and then He's God talking about old covenant and new covenant. Hmm? Sin will not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, old covenant, old covenant, but under grace, new covenant. In new in the new covenant, what happened? Jesus finished the work on the cross. He finished the work, and he says, Now you live out of that. So the work has been finished. So that's why you and I can say, Sin will not have dominion over me. Oh, how can you say that? Because I know this. That my old man was crucified with him. So that the power of sin over my life has been broken. And I no longer serve sin. So under the new covenant, the work is finished on the cross. And we can live out of that. Got it. Okay. So going back to Romans chapter 6. Um, so this is the first thing we should understand that we were crucified with him so that the body of sin is broken so let me just go back uh, go to page yeah lesson number 44 I'll come back to some points in lesson 43 which I have not addressed I'll come back to it but lesson number 44, crucified with Christ. What does it mean? This is on page 63. The old man, old sinful person died. So don't say, oh, in me, I have sinful nature. I have, no, you don't have a sinful nature. Your sinful nature was crucified with Jesus on the you now have the nature of God. You know, you heard the message two Sundays ago. Zoe. What is Zoe? It's a life of God. It's the nature of God that's in you. The God kind of life. The God, God's own nature given to you. That's what you and I have. We are the new man, the new nature. Right? So we were crucified with Christ. Lesson 45, we are buried with Christ. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 to 5. Romans 6, 3 to 5. Lesson 45, page 64. Romans 6, 3 to 5. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, that means we are brought into Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. So we were buried with him. Right? So when Christ was buried, you and I were buried. What does it mean? Think about this. Just imagine. When a person dies and he's buried, it means he is completely separated from this world. Nothing of this world can trouble him anymore. Just imagine, example. Let's say he had a lot of debt. 
ten people every day will trouble him. Hey, you have to pay me. Let's say all other problems, there were lots of troubles. Every day he wakes up, trouble facing all this. Let's say this man dies. Finished. When he's buried, nobody's going to come and say, Hello, pay me this money. Nobody's going to trouble him. So what does it mean? We are buried with Christ. It means everything of the old life, that old sinful life in Adam, we're speaking spiritually, has no claim on you. And that's why we say, 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, let's say it together, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. All things have become new. Think about that. All things are, all things have passed away. All things have become new. You're buried with Christ. So, if anything from the past tries to come and trouble you, I'm buried with Christ. That has no right over me, no claim over me. So, example, before you got born again, let's say you had a very bad temper, huh? very angry, like that firecrackers happen. Let's say, but now you have come into Christ. You've been born again. You are in Christ. Old things have passed away. So you say, oh, short temper. That is my old life. I have been buried with Christ. I am a new creation. You have no place in me, no claim over me. Go away from my life. Reject it. That is the old man, or the thing that belonged to the old life. You now have a new life in Christ. All things are past. So don't let it trouble you. Okay? So you and I have been buried with Christ. That means we have been separated from the old life, the old way of life. Gone. Then, Next lesson, oh, um, yeah, 46, lesson number 46. We are resurrected with Christ. That means when Jesus was resurrected, you and I were resurrected. What does it mean? When you're raised up, you have a new life, new life. You are stepping into a new life. So, example, you can think about the chicken inside, the little chick inside the egg. Hmm? It's inside. At some point, the egg cracks open and the chicken comes out, stepping into a new life. This example, okay, don't say we all came from the egg, you know, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying example, right? It's coming into a new life, it's stepping into a new world, very different from what was inside the egg, coming a new world. You and I, when we have resurrected in Christ, we have stepped into a brand new way of life, a life in Christ. So look at Romans 6. Verses 4, 5, and 8. Therefore, we were parted with him through baptism, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, even we also should walk in newness of life. To be resurrected with Jesus means we have been raised to walk in a new life, new way of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. 
Now, if we die with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. So this new life that we are living, we are living our life in Christ. It's a new way of life. It's different from the past. So in Ephesians 2, verse 1 to 5, it contrasts the old life and the new life. So look at it. Ephesians 2, 1 to 5, page 65. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. We were dead in trespasses and sins. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, and among whom also we all conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he has made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So notice he's saying, you were like this, but now you've made, been made alive with Jesus. That means you have now been raised up into a new life. You were like that. What, were, what was our past life? He says that in verse 1, we were dead in sin. So the old life was a life of trespass and sin, living like that. Then he says in verse 2, we walked according to the course of this world. That means the way the world was going, that's how we were also walking. You were living according to the course of this world. Everybody following that. And he says, according to the prince of the power of the air. The prince of the power of the air is talking about Satan. So our old life was a life that was aligned to Satan. It was under the influence of Satan. And then he says, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. It means if you look around, the people who are disobedient... They have the spirit of the power of the air working in them. That same spirit was working in, in them. That's how we were also living. That was our past life. And then he says, verse 3, We conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh and fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. So that was our past life. We were living according to the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Past life. By nature, we were children of wrath. By our very nature was wicked. That's how our past life was. But it was the past, the old life. But we have been buried. That means we are separated from this old life. This old life can no longer have any control over us. We have been buried. And now we have been raised. He says, we have been raised together with Christ. When you're raised together, you're walking in a new way of life. It's the life in Christ. So our new way of life is not aligned to the past, the way we used to live. It's gone. Right? So we are crucified with Christ. We are buried with Christ. We are raised with, resurrected with Christ. We are crucified with Christ, meaning... Sin has been broken. Sin has been removed. We are buried. That means the past has no control over us. We've been raised. Means we live in a new life. In Christ. Okay. Next. Was for the, uh, lesson 47. We were raised up with Christ. So when Christ left the earth and went into the heavens... Bible is saying we also were raised up with him. Right? Ephesians 2, verse 6. And raised us up together. He raised us up together. That means when Christ ascended, you and I ascended. What does that mean? 
It means that we are separated from this present age. The way of this world, the course of this world, we are not subject to it. Okay? Colossians 3, verses 1, 2, and 3. If you were raised with Christ, so now you've been raised with Christ, Seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So you're raised. Now think about those things. Think from there. So example, think about an eagle and a chicken. Eagle and a chicken. So think about when they are babies, they're just hatched. You put the eagle, eaglet, and the chick on the ground. Okay, both are tiny little birds. Maybe they are both running on the ground, searching for some worms, like that. But after some time, the chicken is growing, eagle, e eagle toss is growing. What happens? The eagle begins to fly. And it flies really high. The chick, chicken, now it's become big. Become a big chicken. But still on the ground only. Can run a little faster, maybe take small jumps, but on the ground. Looks up, eagle, way up. But imagine if the eagle up there says, Ah, when I was young, I used to catch worms on the ground. I want to go back and do that. It's not meant for that. It is meant. For the high skies, right? To show that it will go up in the mountains and the hills, and it will feed on you know bigger animals and creatures. But the problem is, Christians, us believers, God has made us like eagles, but sometimes we think like chicken. And then we also want to behave like chicken, you know, searching for little, little ones, uh, you know, scratching on the mud. Hey, you're an eagle. So he's saying here, yeah, if you were raised with Christ, set your mind on things above. Think from that perspective. Think from heaven's perspective. Don't think like a chicken. Set verse two. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. So don't think like a chicken. Think like an eagle, as somebody whose life is in Jesus, who's in God, who's been raised up with you, separated from the ways of this world. So though the course of this world, the way the world thinks, don't think like that. You think how heaven thinks. You think from that perspective. Because you've been raised up with Christ. Okay? So, we are crucified, we are buried, we are resurrected, we are raised. And then, lesson 48, we are seated with Christ. Ephesians 2 verse 6. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ. So think about that. We are seated with Christ. Same throne. You didn't say, okay, I'll give you one chair next to me. No. You are seated together with Jesus in the same throne. That means this is talking about our place of authority. In the spiritual realm. You know? So can you imagine in the spiritual realm. God has put us 
in the highest place of authority he could ever give us in Christ the same throne where Jesus is sitting so you and I have to think from that perspective and operate from that perspective right now this does not make us God we are still human beings right now we are still seated here in the classroom physically but spiritually God has given us a place and a position in Christ at his own right hand so that is what he has given to us and when it comes to spiritual things we operate from that place in Christ so when you and I are dealing with Satan and his demons we're not dealing with as from here the natural we are dealing with Satan and his demons as from that place in Christ as from the father's right hand in Christ so when you're dealing with Satan you're dealing with his demons you stand as somebody who has full complete absolute authority over Satan and his demons why because you are seated on the same throne Jesus is sitting you are seated together with him in the heavenly place that's a spiritual authority so in the spiritual realm that's the kind of authority you and I carry so we can be fearless when dealing with Satan and his demons not afraid I understand yeah so what must we do with this truth now let's go back to Lesson 45, there was a point there that I did, did not cover, which I just want to mention now. So, uh, this is on page 61. 60, page 61. The form of doctrine. That's on page 61? Okay. Uh, the, the subheading is the form of doctrine. Romans 6, 17 and 18. Romans 6, 17 and 18. Page 61. Here it says 61. It's correct. Maybe sometimes uh, page numbers can get changed. So I'm not sure. Anyway, look for that subheading, the form of doctrine. Romans 6, verses 17 and 18. Now, when Paul is writing Romans 6, he says this, he's writing to the believers, he's saying, but God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, you were, past life, huh? you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So very interesting. He's talking about how believers change in their life. He says, you were slaves of sin. And then, there was this doctrine, this teaching that came, that form of doctrine, to which you were delivered. That means this doctrine in the Greek, the picture that Paul is using is like a mold. Okay? Like, uh, you know, example for many things that people manufacture, right? They use a mold. You know, how do we uh, make something like this, same shape, or especially in plastic, right? How do we make something in a certain shape? What do they do? They have a mold and they pour the hot plastic into it so that when the plastic cools down it takes the shape of that mold so what Paul is saying is the form of doctrine that means the form of teaching that you are listening that is like a mold and when you obey from the heart the teaching you hear it's like you going into that mold. It's going to shape you. 
Are you understanding? So the teaching you hear is like a mold. And when you obey from the heart, wholeheartedly, you receive that form of doctrine that you are receiving, the teaching you are receiving, it will shape your life. So that's why the teaching you receive is so important. Some people don't think, ah, oh, it's okay, I'll sit and listen to any kind of you. Don't be careful what you listen to. Because if you obey that form of teaching, it's going to shape your life. So you better be sure it is the right mold. But what Paul is saying is this. He's telling them, see, you are slaves of sin. But when you receive this teaching, which he is writing about now, Romans 6 and all that, this form of doctrine, you obey from the heart. It shaped you. And what was the result? Verse 16, you've been set free from sin and you became slaves of righteousness. So think about this. How important it is to teach the truth. Because when we teach the truth, it can take people who were slaves of sin and make them and set them free from sin and make them slaves of righteousness. That form of doctrine. When you, of course, you have to obey from the heart. When you obey from the heart, the form of doctrine to which you were delivered, then your life changes. Your life changes. So that's why every Sunday after Sunday we spend 40 minutes, sometimes one hour, teaching the word. Why? Because when you deliver the right form of doctrine, it's the mold that it shapes people's lives and takes them from being slaves of sin to walking free from sin and being slaves of it changes their lives. Right? So what we are reading in Romans 6 is part of Paul. The, the teaching that was has been delivered to the church through the Apostle Paul and that will change our lives. It's, it's a mold that shapes our lives. Right? So that's something I just wanted to point out. And so now let's go back to uh, Lesson 49, which is on page 66. Any questions so yes, far? Uh, yes, go ahead. Pastor, the thing you shared that we are sitting at the place sitting at that most ha heavenly place with God. Yes. Um, so uh, when we are, like you said, that uh, we are dealing with Satan, enemy in that spiritual realm. Yes. We are sitting with God. So when, so it's just, I imagined, like uh, when we are indulging in sin, suppose uh, saying bad words, uh, like, uh, gossiping or like for some people smoking and things like that and anything sin so I just thought of that like is it uh, like when we are doing it in this world we are also doing those things in that spiritual realm no no we so it is our flesh flesh and mind we are committing a believer is a believer who sins, whatever sin it is. He's coming it, co committing it here in his natural being. Right? So it is not affecting God in the sense it's not contaminating God. Not God, but uh, like, is it like affecting our spiritual body also? Like, it while will, we are in that realm? I'm, it will affect that believer in the personally. Uh, his spiritual life, his spiritual relationship with God, and also his ability to exercise that authority that he has in Christ. You know? Why? Because the Bible says, submit to God, resist the devil. But if this believer is entertaining, like giving in to sin in a certain area of his life, every area where he is submitting to the devil, and so submitting to God, he's very submitting to sin, and so submitting to God, those are his areas of weakness. Right? 
So he's not going to be able to administer authority to somebody else in those areas. Because he himself is enslaved. Is that God's will? That's not God's will. It's just that that's his, his, his current journey. And so, Pastor, like uh, then I thought, like if I'm going to explain it to someone, like if I'm explaining these things to other people, yeah, okay, and uh, I tell them, okay, don't do these things because you are sitting with God at yeah. that most heavenly place. Yes, I'll explain it that way, and uh, I'll if I'll say, for example, that suppose that person is smoking or in certain things, so if I tell that person that, uh don't smoke because uh, you are doing the because you are doing like if you are doing these things mm. uh, remember that you are sitting in that most heavenly place so you have to make yourself pure because you are sitting with god so if i say like that so it is like correct thing i am telling you yeah it's 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 good to remind people that spiritually where you are seated um, in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul uses that similar example, but he says, like, you know, he says, you are members of Christ. Then how can we take what is part of Christ and become part of a prostitute? Hmm. 1 Corinthians 6. So he's drawing that similar comparison. Say, hey, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are your body is a part of Christ Himself. That's the way we should see our body. That in my body, I'm actually part of Christ. My whole being belongs to Jesus, spirit, soul, and body. It belongs to Jesus. So then how can I take what belongs to Jesus and put it in sin? This is his uh, uh say his uh, uh, argument or is what he presents. In First Corinthians 6, very similar to what you're saying. And so it's the right thing to say to people, to awaken them to understand. Like, what is your identity? Where you are sitting? Where is your place? Yeah. Okay. So let's take a break now. We'll come back and finish this chapter. And I hope we can cover one more chapter, one more section before, we, uh, before today. Uh, let's take a break. We'll be back uh, at 11. Oh, yeah. Or 10, 10, 10 o'clock.